So here we are again with one of the all-time beigeist boxes, the HP 1000A 600 Plus. Well, well, this time we've got it stuck up in a rack, and we're going to fire it up and have a go with basic RTE usage. But first, we should talk a bit about what RTE actually is. Well, RTE is the operating system most commonly found on the HP 1000 family of computers from the mid-1970s on. The letters RTE stand for Real-Time Executive. While it emerged as the dominant operating system, HP offered quite a few others. There were BCS, DOS, COS, BASIC, Single and Multi-User, MTS, DASIN, ATS, at least. RTE probably won't be familiar to many, uh, many of you. Uh, to put it in historical context, let's compare it with RTE's near contemporary, Unix. That might be more familiar. RTE was just a little bit older. Unix was originally written by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie in 1970. It was created in a research environment, Bell Laboratories. Unix was influenced by a failed attempt to build a world-beating, time-sharing commercial operating system for GE called Multics. It was an academic commercial partnership with MIT and Bell Labs. Thomas and Ritchie's Unix started as a two-man side project. Their design reacted against the behemoth Multics whilst recognizing its good bits. RTE, by comparison, was a commercial development through and through. It had a full project team and corporate sponsorship. The father of all early HP software, including RTE, is Roy Clay. He'd been hired away from Control Data Corporation, where he'd been working on Fortran compilers, among other things. The very first HP operating system was BCS, or the Basic Control System. Clay is listed as its developer. The software wasn't a system monitor style operating system as such. Since BCS wasn't a runtime, there was no underlying process. The closest you got to a startup process was a collection of loaders and drivers in memory. A loader is the bit of the OS that copies your program into memory and starts it. RT is much more of what we might think of as an operating system. It's a full system monitor. HP released it in 1968 and first listed it in the 1969 catalog. Roy Clay's development team was led by Lee Johnson and included Ron Matsumoto and Russell Martin. RT was fully outlined and flowcharted. The team started from a design objective statement, and in it they laid out the system's purpose. To permit more efficient use of computers by providing users with the capability of scheduling simultaneous execution of programs in a single computer in real time while doing non-real-time programming such as compiling and debugging in the background. To create RTE, the team spent between them three years in development and testing. When it was written two years later, the first Unix didn't even multitask. But what about this real-time stuff anyway? Is it just multitasking? Well, HP explained real-time computing this way. A real-time system can be defined as one in which the computer receives data directly from the point of origin, processes it, and returns the result sufficiently fast to affect the environment at the time. They said it should have a priority scheme for concurrent execution of multiple programs and a foreground background partition, separating real-time tasks from non-real-time tasks. The system will normally handle all error conditions without requesting help from the operator. There are no end of real conditions, card decks to be loaded, or other operations which would ever require halting the computer. So there's more to real-time than multitasking. The concept of protected foreground and best effort background tasks is foundational. It's there from the first to last versions. Both types of tasks have two varieties, one memory resident and one swappable. RTE continued to develop until the early 1980s. In the first 1968 release, RTE needed 32 kilobytes of RAM and 384 k of disk drive. It didn't really have a file system and it wasn't multi-user. In 1973, however, HP rewrote it as RTE2. RTE2 is a pretty big deal. They added multi-terminal access, making it multi-user as well as multi-process, and they also added file management. Now, while this didn't follow a tree organization principle, it at least somewhat abstracted the file management from disk geometry. The rewrite also added networking, and HP began marketing a hierarchical distributed computing package on top of RTE. RTE3 came out in 1976. It added support for up to 512 kilobytes of RAM. In earlier systems, they had been limited to 64K total. RTE3 provided each program a 38K usable address space out of the 512. And in 1978, RTE4 increased that usable program memory from 38K to 546. Running changes to version 4 also allowed a new maximum 2 megabyte address space. RTE5 was released as 4B. 
that launched in 1979 and provided updated session management. Now, at this point, the hardware was split between the newer L and A series 1000s and the older E, F, and M computers. The two family branches used different I.O. architectures. This required a different distribution of RTE, initially called RTE-L, and later RTE-A. There was only one more major RTE release for the E, F, and M systems, and that came out in 1981. It was called 6VM to indicate another iteration of memory or reorganization for better virtualized shareable memory structures. It also added CI as a new shell and file system. For the first time, there was a hierarchical directory structure and some Unix-like shell constructs too. RTEA got CI as well, but that was it. There were maintenance releases and driver updates, but this was the end of new release development. By the early 1980s, HP's computer lines had proliferated so that they had a 9800 series, 3000 series, 1000 series, a 500, 300, 200, 100, and an 80 series. Every one of those had different hardware and software. In a major repositioning, HP began consolidating their mid-ranges. They would develop an entirely new series of microprocessors, PA RISC, and of course, HP began Unix adoption. After a decade of coexistence, Unix began to supplant RTE at HP itself. RTE-A, RTE-4B, RTE-6VM, well, they lingered in support until the millennium, but the 1000 series hardware was only sold until 1991. The A-series are the last generation of the HP 1000 CPU design. This is a 600 plus and it dates to 1983. To get it running, we're indebted to the HP Museum in Australia and Rick Boss, uh, who are providing the copies of this system image that we're going to use for demonstration. This generation of HP should be used with a 2620 series of terminals. We don't happen to have one of those here at Beja Vision. So for today, we're going to make two modern cheats to get a live RTE session. One will be to use a terminal program on a Mac. Uh, we're using the most excellent retro cool term. Our second cheat is an emulated hard drive. Working HP IB interface disks are getting rare, and that's what you really need to run this. Increasingly, the enthusiast community uses drive emulation software running on PCs. So up here is our PC. The HP 1000 is connected over an HP IB cable. The PC is wired into this monitor and keyboard. We'll fire that up first and get the program running. On the laptop side, we're going to fire up Retro Cool Term and point it at our USB serial adapter. That all goes off to this breakout box we used to get the signals right. Then off to a custom-built edge connector serial cable. And here we go on power. And there we go. VCP comes right up. Uh, in order to boot into uh, RTE, we're going to uh, BCD or BDC. Let's see if I can remember which. Oh, hey. Second time's charm. So the configuration of RTE is held in a welcome file, uh, which is equivalent to a uh, init file or auto exec bat, something like that. I'll just w have to wait for it to, to roll through its startup routine here. Okay, now, quirk at the way the serial console is working on this at the moment. I need to dump out of it to actually get into CI and reconnect. So I'm going to do a Control A, Control K, uh, and then just jump right back in. So the first thing we're going to do um, is just to have a, a quick look at uh, the array of commands that are available. Um, there is a, a general purpose help command uh, that will give you a listing of all the common commands that are available in CI. CI in this particular version, uh, this late version, has a lot of Unix-like uh, commands that have been injected that effectively duplicate the original RTE functionality. We'll see some of those as we go along. So you'll see things like uh, ls as well as dl. So if I do uh, a dl, that's directory list. Okay. Uh, but the Unix equivalent, ls, is also supported. So we are currently in the programs uh, directory. We do a dl. Maybe it'll let me do that. Yeah, there we are. 
that is the root. So if we uh, change to the system directory, and CD originally was WD to set working directory. And in there you can see the welcome file that I was talking about, uh, and you also have copies of the operating system, either snapshots or uh, full systems that are what's actually stored into memory when the system boots up. Um, so I'll just do a quick list, which is equivalent to sort of like a Unix cat or a type in, in DOS of what the welcome files actually look like. There you go. And like I said earlier, um, this is really sort of like an auto exec bet where it's setting all the devices, it's uh, uh, setting the, the starting services and so forth on the system. And that's what gets us into uh, a basic command prompt. So I think what most of us need to be able to do to navigate on a command shell initially is be able to do some basic navigation around the system. So we've seen the programs directory. If I go over to the libraries directory, Okay, you can see some of the supporting libraries that are loaded in the system. FMP is the file manager support library. You've got uh, a Pascal support library, a security primitives library. These are all the sort of supporting libraries that get linked in uh, if you go and build a program. So I've got a code directory which we're going to use for our sample code. So if I do a WD over to code, see if I've got anything in here. I do. So the first thing we'll learn how to do is delete things. So instead of RM or DEL, you get PU for purge. So we'll get rid of my Fortran source there, and we'll get rid of uh, the output listing. And the relocatable file. And the executable. So in order to copy things, uh, instead of doing uh, a CP, you've got CO. So we're going to do a CO from uh, my source directory here. Where we've got uh, the original. So that copies it into place. If I wanted to rename it at this point, uh, I would use RN to rename the file. Uh, and I could call that Originally, uh, you can only have six characters in a file name, but under the CI version of the file system, you can do more than that. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do that cat command again, just to give you a, an idea of what this little source file is going to be like, because that's what our, our little demo will be here. We'll walk through the, the process of actually creating a, a source file and compiling it on the system and executing it. So if I do... Uh, what is now a font file by accident. And we go, we've got our Fibonacci uh, code with, uh, written in Fortran, uh, and it has a fixed number of iterations, uh, which is the E variable. You go 32 times around and spit out whatever number is the 32nd uh, number in the Fibonacci sequence. So we'll take a second and correct the name. Back to what it should be. And now we're going to actually do a compile and run on this. So to do a compile in Fortran, uh, RU to tell it to run it. The Fortran compiler's FTN7X for the Fortran 77. We'll give it the source file, which is our local uh, Fibra Fortran. And we're going to tell it to use the defaults for the rest of these arguments. And that's a good result. So I got no errors, no warnings on that. And if I wanted to actually run that now, I still have to link it because the file that it created was, in addition to the list file, the, the rel file. So the list file is a typical uh, compiler output. Where it's going to give us uh, our original source code and how that got uh, mapped. And then it's going to give us our assembler. 
and our symbol table uh, and any cross references at the bottom. So in order to actually run the application, you have to link it. And this, of course, maps the program to how it will be laid into memory and cross-references any hard libraries to their memory location within the system as it's laid out on this computer. So that should now give us an executable file, which is a .run file. So I'll just tell it to run that. And it will do something really uninspiring. It just spit out an integer. Well, OK. Um, if I were updating or debugging a program and I wanted to change um, the code, um, the standard utility on here isn't VI or Emacs or anything like that. You have to use edit. So we're going to run edit. In the editor, you have a couple of basic single key commands. So if I wanted to list out the entire file, I'll give it an L. But that changes my current editing location to the end of the file. To go back to the top, I have to give it the line number for the top. I can go plus a given number of lines, or I can go minus a given number of lines, or I can try and guess what the line number is. Um, here I'm trying to go to uh, E equals 32, and I want to change how many iterations the program's going to do. So I'm going to give it uh, 9. That takes us to I. Uh, if I hit Enter again, it moves one line further. Now, I can do two things. I can either do an R and just type out the whole line again. That's a replace. Uh, I can do a D and then an I to insert uh, in two separate commands. Or I can do this, which takes the present line. And every one of those slashes is going to basically tell it to do nothing. When I get to my 32, I'm just going to change it to 15. Okay. So now, if I go back to the top of the file and then list it out again, we can see it's going to... 15 iterations. Now to save and escape, what you do is E for exit and R for replace because there's already a file. So now our source file is updated. We have to go through the process of rerunning the uh, compile and uh, link again. So uh, are you 7x You'll notice that it's not particularly case sensitive. Okay, still likes that. I will do a link. Oops, how are you? And it'll warn us as I'm writing the original file. And there we are. So finally, we can run. You can see we have a much smaller number there. Okay, so that's a basic editing session. Um, you would use these commands for creating or managing any particular file. You could create a, a file from, from scratch. If you wanted to see what was going on in the system, there are a couple of systems management functions to see you know, if you've got a background application running or whatever else. If you just use WhatsApp, which is WH, with no argument, it tells you what's running in your particular space which is not very much. It's the command line interpreter of WhatsApp itself. Okay, now if we had wanted to uh, see what's happening in everybody else's space, we can give WhatsApp uh, a different argument, any argument, uh, and here's all of the processes that are running. Uh, if you look down on the left, those uh, that CM and CIX are actually just copies of CI that are being run in the background in case our foreground CI needs to swap out. Last little trick with WhatsApp, uh, is to, to give it a PA argument. Now, um, the concept of partitions is how memory is allocated here rather than processes. And so these are all of the active uh, uh, process memory spaces that are out there in the system now. You can also have a look at all of the devices that are mapped into the system. Now, this is a default set, so what you're seeing is not actually what's connected. Um, so these are all of the different device IDs that are mapped, although not necessarily connected. You would have to bring the device up to uh, enable it, and the only ones we're really enabling at this point uh, are by default the disk and 
this interface. And you can see uh, what uh, interfaces are, are connected in terms of consoles um, by uh, using another little command, which is S port or serial port. And there we are, the console on logical unit one. Two more little commands I want to show you, um, just to see what's happening in the system. Uh, the first is a little bit ru like running a VM stat or a SAR. Meter is actually the CPU meter. And that's going to tell us you know, exactly what CPU usage is, is being uh, taken by the, the system uh, for each of the open processes. And here, a bit like VM stat, you can see that it's repeating over and over again. Okay. The last one was SAM, uh, and SAM is going to give you the current uh, memory utilization across the system. Um, when we're done with the system, we simply tell it we want to exit out of the shell, an EX, uh, and that cleans up the, the shell and leaves only the background uh, processes running, and they're already synced to disk, so we can literally just run and power the, the system down. So that's a basic gallop through RTE. We've done some basic session stuff, looked around the system. Obviously, there were a lot of integrations and applications that you could run on such a system. But for today, that's an intro. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, leave a like and a subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of content, uh, or if you want to have a deeper dive in future. But for today, thanks for watching. Bye for now.